It's about how business helps society be better. And being here, that's what you guys are doing. This is an outstanding opportunity for me to talk to some of the best of the brightest folks who are out here. So, uh, YMCA, what more can we say? Always doing some amazing things. Okay, let's get the uh, festivity started. They gave me a list of questions because they need to keep me on track. Because, believe it or not, I can get side sidelined sometimes. Okay, so first up, this is called Cultural Conversation, and uh, we have some great guests who are going to talk to us this evening. First, we're going to have uh, Nana Garden. Welcome to the program, ma'am. So, Nana Garden, it is uh, welcome to the program, ma'am. Virginia Asian Advisory Board, 
Uh, I was chair for a couple of years uh, during a really challenging time uh, during anti-Asian hate and, and COVID. So that really, you know, reinforced uh, my resilience. Uh, and what is not in my bio is the fact that I really want to and join Jessica. You know, I want to run for office. You know, I want to affect change um, at the systemic level, right? Uh, at the policy level. And so I'm going to be running for the next year for a seat in the House of Delegates. Here you go. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you very much to you. Remember, I asked you, how do we find the next generation of public servants? People who understand the system and really want to make our society better. All right, next up we have uh, Khalid Kashoum. Welcome to the program, sir. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, I really first want to thank uh, YMCA, Mike, uh, the team from YMCA. They worked very hard to make this event a uh, success, and I'm very sure it's going to be a successful event. So, briefly, Khalid uh, Kashoum, uh, I'm uh, originally from Jordan. I've been a resident in Richmond for a long time, uh, over 30 years in Richmond. Uh, I think some of the questions can probably tell you a bit more about myself, but um, my wife also here as well. She's part of uh, the team here that actually make this event success too as well. Uh, so we appreciate all the work that's been done. Uh, again, I do work for, or used to work for some level for years. I did franchising in uh, about 12 states in the U.S. Uh, mainly change career because just not staying at home as much and from uh, preventing me from doing what I really like to do, which is involved with the community and do more actual work here in the community. So I made that change because it was just taking me away from what I used to do in here in Richmond. Volunteer for a lot of activities here and done that. Uh, to get back in the rhythm of, of uh, helping others to as well and make our community the best place uh, for everybody. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> hey, folks, that is the panel. It's an, it's an outstanding group. This is going to be good. Okay, uh, so we're going to start uh, nine, and then we'll go down, down the, the line there. What motivated your parents' decision to move them to this country, and how do you think it shaped your life? I would say that it was my decision to come here. Um, at the time that I decided to come to the United States, my dad was already deceased and my mom um, was a bit away from me because I was in college in Ghana and I wanted to have the rest of my education. I received a Bachelor of um, Arts degree in Sociology from um, the University of Cape Coast and also a diploma in education from the same university. And with my uh, master's, I, I always, to becoming a PhD and a professor. So I thought it was an opportunity for me to migrate to the United States. It wasn't that um, easy because you needed to prove that you'll be able to pay um, the tuition and have at least one year of living expenses um, to be able to um, get the visa to come. Well, we worked all that out. Um, and here I am, uh, five years after arrival, I end up comparing um, sociology degrees in both the master's and the PhDs after I've made it straight into the PhD program from the end of that. Um, how, how, how has that shaped my life? Uh, obviously, it has made me who I am today. I came with just a bachelor's degree and um, a diploma in education, which enabled me to be a teacher. Uh, but right now, I'm a university uh, professor. I just um, ended a term of step down as a um, chair of the Department of Sociology and Criminal Justice at Virginia State University, where I believe I'm impacting the lives of uh, young first generation, mostly um, African American uh, students. As um, I mean, as a sociologist with a PhD from a, predomin a predominantly Hispanic university, I believe that I have been um, stressed in doubt to be able to understand minority cultures and also be able to um, support and probably that's why I'm so much um, engaged within my community um, with the African Community Network and the Ghanaian Association. All right, thank you. So uh, Elmer, everybody knows you as a businessman. 
What obstacles do you think your parents or family faced when you guys got here? And how do you think you overcame them? Same question, huh? Oh, okay. <laughs> See, through a curveball there. Yeah, okay, let's we'll go with the same question. What motivated your decision to move to this country? No, I mean, uh, to me, it was, you know, uh, there was no, no choice. You know, it's like, uh, for many of us, you know, immigrants coming from, uh, you know, uh, Central America, the uh, United States might be the only, you know, the only choice that you have. And, and my dad, I mean, he came in 85, and, uh, and you know, I was 14 when he came to the United States, and, uh, and, and it was, you know, it wasn't easy but for me, you know, being in, in this, you know, wonderful country, it has, you know, really changed my life. I got three, you know, we have three, three children and, and now we, you know, are getting ready to have our eighth uh, grandkid. So, mm. uh, been it's, it's a blessing. <laughs> it's a blessing for us. All right, thank you, thank you. So, main same question. Um, well, my father came to this country first. Um, that's typically, I think, how a lot of um, Chinese immigrants came over. And my father had to work for other people that came before him in their restaurants. Uh, so my father and my mother and my three siblings were left back in China. So my father came first, and then eventually he was able to bring my mother and, and um, three siblings over. My closest sibling is 12 years um, older than I am, so you can probably guess mom and dad hadn't seen each other for a while when I, I came along. So, um, but you know, you think about, you know, I've always heard this phrase of, you know, you're in a different country, and you hear the streets are paved in gold here in the United States, mm -hmm. way back when. And that's, I think, what brought my parents um, and family here. And of course, leaving, you know, the uh, communist China, you know, there were just struggles um, back in the day. And like everybody else, is trying to come to America to live the American dream of equal opportunity and financial success. And um, no matter what your background, no matter what your zip code, uh, just having an equal opportunity uh, to succeed. There you go. Khalid, last question, sir. All right. Uh, so basically, uh, I had a career in where I'm from. Actually, I'm from Jordan. When I came here, when I, when I made the decision, actually, things got tough for me. Uh, I have a bachelor's degree in agriculture, and I have my own farm in Jordan. And if you are all recall, the first uh, Gulf War, where uh, the Iraqi invaded Kuwait, and pretty much Jordan, a small country, has all the produce go to uh, mainly to Kuwait and to the Gulf. And based on that, we have no market. So for two years, I did struggle, and uh, I just I could not find anything to do in there. Uh, the decision to come to America was not really behind money. Really, the decision was because of what I hear about America, of, of the freedom, that you actually can speak your mind freely in this country. And that's really what brought me to this country here. And since I got here, I, I can't dream of any better. Uh, really, money comes and goes every day. It's just the fact that you actually can live your life free. You can speak up your mind. You can make a lot of connection with different people. That's really what's motivated me and make me who I am right now. I did learn a lot. Uh, I spent more than half of my life in the U.S. I learned a lot and I'm really thankful every day for everybody in this country here to let me in and to work with everybody. A lot of times folks come from other countries to language is a barrier. Uh, Khalid, let's start. Uh, how do you overcome that? So for folks who are here, we're concerned about the language barrier. Talk about how you guys overcame that. All right, so uh, basically I am, um, English was the second language in Jordan. 
uh, when I went to college, college actually, I studied the four years in, in English. So, uh, was not the problem with the language itself, the problem was with the accents. So when you're coming in here very much, it's, you know, I remember the first days when I got to JFK and I went to New York. Uh, I stayed in New York for over a year. And I tell you what, it just, you know, it's like one time I, you know, you try to get asked for something simple and people don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> You know, you have actually to write it down for these people. Oh, oh, this one you mean? I'm like, yeah, that's what I meant. Uh, <laughs> but it, it is really, uh, and again, I, I, I admire a lot of the people, which is, I work at 7-Eleven for 28 years. And the last 10 years I worked with 7-Eleven, actually, I was doing franchising, which is I work with, with a lot of uh, ethnic group to franchise stores too, and make their dream come reality. And I, I, because very much I struggled at the beginning, so I understand those people, where they come from. A lot of times they like to deal with me because I kind of, you know, I understand what they, where they come from. The language, the accent, sometimes you have to understand that person, where they come from, to be able to tell how you can actually help them out. And I'm really happy my experience shaped me to help, I think, over 300 people to franchise their own some level stores, which is, you know, again, a lot of people come here because they really they want to be their own boss. And I'm happy that this experience, the first few months in the U.S. actually taught me how to actually understand who's coming in. And there's a lot of people, they come here, don't speak the language. And I dealt with some of them too as well. It just, you know what, I brought some of these people that they have no knowledge of English and they come in here and they actually manage themselves and they were able to communicate and develop uh, their dream in the U.S. So, uh, May, you're, you're born here, your siblings were not. Let's talk about the language differences and how that was navigated in your home. Yeah, absolutely. When in, so when I was little, my siblings, uh, this was actually, we lived in Charlottesville for a little bit. Uh, I remember my siblings going to um, English as a second language uh, classes. And again, me being you know, uh, speaking English and our Chinese dialect, you know, I was actually put in a lot of situations where I had to translate quite often um, for my parents, for my siblings, again, you know, taking orders in the restaurant and things like that. Um, so that just kind of, I, I feel like, has always put a burden on um, many, many of us growing up, you know, because we're kids, uh, don't understand and appreciate kind of the, the ability to be able to do that for our family. Uh, so just, again, seeing, um, and going, going to classes, and I also remember helping um, my family and extended family members study for their citizenship test. So that was an important part and, and very important milestone to achieve uh, to become an American. There you go. So, man, Elmer, you are the, the realtor, the bilingual guy. Talk about being bilingual in the, uh, in the business community and what that means and how you guys do it. That's right, I got one good question, sir. That was it. <laughs> For me, uh, it was it was really hard. You know, coming here uh, 14, you know, almost like came in December, so the birthday is in January, so 15. And, uh, and I went to uh, Washington uh, Lee High School in Arlington, and most like, maybe like 30% of the students, you know, they were, you know, Hispanic. And then it was really hard to learn, you know, the language because if I wanted something, they would translate for me. So I'm like, you know, didn't feel like the need to, to, to learn, but then we moved. And when we moved, you know, it was like maybe 1% Hispanic. So that's when I'm like, you know, I need to do something. So I you know, started uh, classes to uh, ESL, and I was the first uh, Hispanic you know, to graduate from uh, Yorktown High School in Arlington from ESL classes. And, uh, and I was you know, getting on of those. But, uh, but, you know, and then I'm like, I mean, if I can you know, learn English, and, uh, 
in the steel, I mean, now is it is still hard because the, when English is, you know, your uh, second language, uh, there's like sometimes. I mean, it, it, it's really hard to to be you know some words that are really hard to, to to pronounce. But then, you know, I mean, we always uh, we're fighters, so we don't let that, you know. Uh, do anything to us, which is, you know, we love one another. And, you know, becoming a realtor and, and, and helping uh, families is something that my wife always, you know, pushed me to do. Just like, I mean, you're good at talking to people, then uh, you're good at helping because you always, you know, say what's going on, and, and then I. I got my license in 2005 before we went to Richmond and, and we've been doing and helping a lot of families. One of the things, so uh, my program, we understand the power of giving back to the community. That man right there, he supports a ton, a ton of organizations in the community. So congratulations and kudos to you, sir. Uh, Dr. Derby, let's talk about your transition to America and uh, the language piece as well. Okay, so, um, well, I don't know if that's one of the things or bad things as far as language in Ghana because when the colonizers came, uh, there was one thing that they did that some of us don't appreciate, but maybe in this context, I should say I appreciate it because English is the, uh, is the official language of Ghana. So I came in, having not learned it already because since I started learning it as a kid, and it was always the mode of uh, communication for official stuff. Uh, and I had lived overseas um, in the West Indies at some point uh, where I got part of my education. So it wasn't, English was not, language was not really a problem, but accent uh, was the issue because a lot of the things I um, said, people really understood me because I pronounced things differently with different accents and all that. And Miami also, as we, or most of us know, is predominantly Hispanic. Uh, so apart from this, I think, my accent was an issue for some people. Many of the residents also couldn't speak English. So it was a bit of um, a challenge. So that has to be there again, yes. So really quickly, let's talk about the cultural differences between your home and then coming to America. Uh, when you got here, what was, what was the thing that struck you about being in America? You know, uh, you heard that it was paved with gold, that's what some other people say. Uh, maybe it is, maybe it isn't. But how did that affect and when did you see the cultural differences between your home country and America? Um, I would say individualism of America. Because many African countries and African cultures, um, primarily what I was exposed to growing up in Ghana is more like the external family system where there is the dependence. It's actually the village, bringing up the child, all right, where communities depended, or members of communities depended on each other, um, where there is, when there is family, you can rely on your neighbor, or to where parents or your friends can just spank you for not doing the right on behalf of your parents, right? So it was more a bigger community for me than when I got here. Not that I didn't know, because I had already studied sociology my bachelor's degree, so I did understand um, the differences in some aspects of um, the American culture. But it was still uh, a shock to me as someone who traveled along here. I didn't have a lot of family members here, by the way, but they are in Boston, Pennsylvania, uh, and not in Florida. So I was alone for time until I found a few people that I could relate to more culture. So, Khalid, uh, you've been in this country for a long time. Talk, talk a little bit about what that means for you, the cultural differences for you here that you see, and now you see other folks coming here, and you can understand their point of view. Uh, yeah, it, it, it is definitely different, as uh, Dr. Derby said. Uh, it is different uh, in there. It's like more and more family ties. Uh, I feel like, you know, everybody watching you, everybody watching over you. If you need something quick, you can actually get that help. 
when you come in here very much, a lot of us probably came in here, and you know, I see a lot of probably the audience too as well, came probably here single out, you don't have any family in here, you have to make your way uh, in, in this society, which is a lot different between your culture and, and the culture in the U.S. here. The, the main thing really uh, that, that really uh, get you in this society here, if you are open your mind, that you want to be all different. We all learn from each other and we all cannot live on ourselves. Nobody can live on their own in a desert. You definitely have to live with somebody. You actually have to count on somebody to get you through this life in here. Uh, so this is really in here when you start knowing your way around. And definitely just don't sit at home and say, you know what, I can get it done by myself. You gotta reach out. You know what, your neighbor can't help you because your neighbor become your kind of close friend and family member for you. So don't close the door on yourself and say, you know what, I can get it done or I need my cousin or my uncle. We are here in, in a big country and uh, different culture uh, and definitely when you reach out to these people you can learn that you know what I can't own, I can't count on Elmer right here to help me out I can't count on my main here to help me or Dr. Derby here to help me out just don't close the door and say you know I can't do it on my own please reach out there's a lot of resources in this country in here in your neighbor in your school in your workplace that actually people are willing to help you Thank you. So, um, Nate, you're kind of unique here. You straddle the line between uh, American life and the life that your parents came from and your siblings. Talk a little bit about that in your household, how you saw things, and then how your your siblings and your parents uh, viewed the cultural differences. Uh, well, I can, I can speak to just generally um, cultural differences. I mean, there, there are stereotypes, right? I can not say a word and people will assume something about me, right? Well, many of us, right? For me, and I think for many uh, Asians, is look at me and um, perpetual foreigner men. I must not be from around here. So those kinds of um, seeing somebody being different, then there's, there's bias with that, right? So like I said, I don't say a word, there's an assumption that I don't speak English very well. And I've come across many, many instances of where people have assumed that I do not speak English at all. Um, in fact, I've been told I speak perfect English. <laughs> I don't know what that means, but I speak perfect English. Um, you know, the, the, the other thing is, uh, from a cultural differences standpoint, is you know, seeing somebody without you know, opening their mouth, there's all these biases. With my family, same thing. Um, you know, the way, the way they're dressed is different. The way, you know, I also interacted with my, my family and wanting to do something different. Like I said, I, I considered myself an American, we were called ABCs, American born Chinese, and considered ourselves Americanized because there's this culture of being American, you know, and I, I always say this to people of, you know, when, when people say, oh, I, you know, I'm going to come to this country and assimilate, I don't think you should come to this country and assimilate. That means you're going to give up who you are. You come to this country to acculturate. You have culture, you bring the culture, and you can help integrate it and share your culture. And so I think coming, coming to this country and then seeing my parents trying to live that American dream, it felt like they had to give up something of themselves to work hard. And then of course, raising me to be very American, right? Making sure I get a good education, speak perfect English, you know what I mean? It just, you know, it, it's, again, it's trying to create um, people that we're not, right? somebody else. Thank you. Real quickly, so this is on a personal note. My friend in the back right there is recording uh, Adriana Duarte. She is the host of Dota Latino. You can stop now. Thank you. Thank you. I know you got something to do. I'm sorry about that. So, folks, uh, so make sure you check her out, Dota Latino. She is going to be at the